a little old school uh, tonight and read it from, from the page. So, uh, so uh, 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 our text is taken in Genesis 41. Those, uh, 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 I guess we're live, right, James? Yeah, so anyone watching? So, sorry, I, I had a little technical difficulty, so we won't have our slides up. But you can find this text in Genesis, the 41th chapter. We'll, be, we'll read verses 44 through 57. And it reads like this. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name, Zaphnoth, Penea, and he gave him as a wife, Asenath, the daughter of the potty Pharaoh, priest of On. So Joseph went out all over the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Now in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly. So he, so he gathered up all the food of the seven years, which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities. He laid up in every city the food of, of the fields which surrounded them. Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting, for it was in, immeasurable. And to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, whom Asenath, the daughter of the Potipharah, priest of On, bore to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second he called Ephraim. For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Then the seven years of plenty which was, were in the land of Egypt ended. And the seven years of famine began to come as Joseph had, had said. The famine was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Then Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, uh, whatever he says to, you to, to, says to you, do. The famine was all over the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. And the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. So all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all lands. <clears throat> what do you see here? What's your observations, Bruce? Well, no, of course, and this is just a human part of me, but uh, verse 47 and 48, now in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly. So he gathered up all the food of the seven years, which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the city, so on and so forth. It says he gathered up the food. It doesn't say whether it was taken from the people as a tax. It doesn't say whether it was paid for. It doesn't say how he got it. It says he gathered it. So then uh, you go to verse 56. So the famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. Right, right. Now, if, again, this is Bruce thinking. Uh -huh. But if you came and you took something from me, or you said by threat of the government, you've got to give me mm -hmm. 5, 10, 20 percent of whatever you have, and then a few years down the road, I've got to buy it back from you, what I had already produced, I'm going to be kind of cranky about it. Well, th then if, if you're raised in a United States monarchy, yeah. uh, because that's not the way the ancient world actually thought of things. Their ownership was not was was what you were allowed to by by by, by ancient rule. But I I understand in our in our modern in our modern day, I mean we do the same thing. We pay taxes. I don't see anything for my taxes. Uh, you know, and, and then we turn around and they ask look for more from me. And so so uh, I can, I can understand it does kind of. I had one person say, why could God come into the promised land and take people's land? I'm like because it wasn't their land. You know, it was it was God's land, and sometimes if, if we're not careful, we begin to project a modern view on, on you know you know what I mean uh, on on, a, on an ancient text. And, yes, and that, well, and then in verse fifty seven it says, "So all the countries came to Joseph, Joseph in Egypt to buy grain." And I'm thinking, let's change it around just a little bit. Here in the United States, we see that something's going to happen, and so we we take steps to protect our citizens right, right. 
So then you have citizens from other countries coming, who their country didn't prepare them for it. Right, right. And it's not necessarily a case of being generous or not being generous, but if I give to you, then I don't have that much left to give to my family, for example. Yeah. And I'm just wondering. Yeah. Well, why? one of the, and, and along that lines, Melody brought up a uh, week before last, she's like, you know, they only took up a fifth. How could that cover everybody for the year? But when you read, read a little bit more into it, you see here that, that, that in those seven years, God provided so much more. You know, and I think part of God's plan was not just to provide for e Egypt, but it was to provide for, if, they, if, if, if it was just been for Egypt, the brothers would have never come into the picture. If it was just for Egypt, uh, Israel would have died in, 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 the, in, in the famine. Uh, I believe, I believe there was such, such an abundance, as, as you can tell there from what it says about, about Joseph, that he, he gathered so much that he had to stop gathering. He said, I don't have the, they have the place for it. So a fifth during those seven years was equal to, to a, a famine year plus on top of that uh, to be able. And probably one thing it probably did is it probably uh, secured uh, Egypt against enemies and, and uh, for, for, for probably for, for generations to come. Rhonda, I think you had something. You, you answered. You, everybody was supposed to give a fifth of the crop. That's where... Yeah. Yeah, that's where Joseph got. So, so that was that was that was the requirement by by Pharaoh and the and, 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 and the requirement that that was handed down there. And then later that they would they would monetize it uh, uh, when when it came time for the family. Uh, I don't know what they had to, as far as land. If the public uh, in, in Egypt in that time owned their own land, or the government just uh, let them borrow it. You know what I'm saying? I don't. I really don't think any ancient civilization owned property. Right. Well, that's uh, very you know, possible. And I was thinking yeah. about that too. But if they did, uh, they probably made some type of a deal with with the people that had the land mm -hmm. that they knew a famine was coming. If you let us use your land to grow food, right. Right. we'll sell it back to you at a discount. It could be, but you, you okay, got to understand that you got, have, you know, no, they still understand. had the four of the fifths. Right, right. You know, yeah. so so more than likely, not only were they more than enough, they were probably selling what they had as well, because the fifth would feed all of Egypt oh, yeah. and the world. So so uh, so yeah, I, I don't think any of the, the those farmers were left in a in a bad way. It wasn't like a 50-50 split there for them. It was, it was, it was that, that, uh, yes, Al. Because I know in the 60s, I lived on a farm during, during the 60s, and, and we, we had some huge surpluses nationwide. Right. So John Kennedy, he was president, he said, he came up with the, he, he and I think it was Orville Freeman, who was Secretary of Agriculture, they came up with this idea, let's, let's put that land in rest, and we'll pay the farmers not to plant it. Right, right. And that's what they did, mm -hmm. and they came out really good on it. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm thinking that the, you, what you have here is a cooperation between the government and the people that they serve uh, to make things go smooth. And, and that, so that, could, yeah, that, that could be that could be very likely. We just yeah. don't have any no, no, any, any record of, 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 of any kind of agreement that was, that was made. All we knew that it, it started immediately. It didn't, it was, you know, it started immediately. Right. Because uh, some families can't be predicted. They just show That's up. That's right. Just like drought. Drought shows up. And then you, you expect rain, you don't get it. And one yeah. thing you decide, we're in a drought. That's right. That's right. It, 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 it comes quickly. <laughs> yes. So I took, a, I read this several times over the last two weeks. I took a completely different view kind of the opposite of what Bruce did. Try to look at this as God's miracle. And I think it is a true miracle that God was totally in control. Even Pharaoh mm -hmm. mentioned a man of God. We need a man of God to run all these things. Mm -hmm. He didn't know where to find it and he talked with Joseph. It almost is like Joseph was self-prophesying by interpreting a dream because everything that he interpreted that God gave him interpretation mm -hmm. came through right. by the hand of God. Yeah. 
So as I was studying this just in the last couple of days, what came to my mind again was Isaiah 55, 8, 9, where God said, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Right. As the heavens are higher, my ways are higher and my thoughts are higher. So kind of taking, trying to take yourself out as a human, they were probably just as mind boggled as we would have been that things were going as good as they were right, right. for the seven years preparing them for what was coming. And and I, I do think that I do think that that, that there would have had to be quite a level of of appreciation if somebody come in and told you. You're going to have seven good years and you're going to have seven years of drought. And you were able to store away and stack away. Then at the end of that, you would, you, would, you would have to applaud the man that not only saved your farm, he saved your life. Right. Because, because and he saved your neighbor's lives. And he turned seven nightmare years into a, a year that was... And, and, and in, in the dream, it said, Joseph interpreted in the dream that the seven years of drought famine would eat up to seven years. It, it yeah. was going to be not just that it was really hard to comprehend what that's was really right. going to come in those seven years. That, that's right. That's right. That, that, that's for sure. And and so so yeah, it could, it could, it could very well. And, and and you never know toward the end of that uh, uh, that they may have had to rely on the four the four parts that that some of the other that some of the other uh, sources had. Yes. Because <coughs> Egypt to become an even greater power than what it had been. Yes, because, yes. Because when, when, when you go to war with, with somebody, you've got to have a supply line to keep those people fighting. That, that's right, that's and right. since Egypt had all the food, mm -hmm. the only thing they could do was be coming by food. They couldn't attack them because they didn't have enough, enough food to, to maintain an army to defeat a, a country like Egypt. And, and Egypt had, a, had another advantage, too, that you, you know. Uh, they had the best weather report because they, they knew that if we just made it to, to, to for the next seven years, uh, you know, that it's going to be better. Other countries didn't know that. And so d during this whole time, not only was Egypt supplying for them, Egypt was fattening itself. Egypt was, Egypt was, was benefit uh, from, from, from this, from, from, from this thing. And as you pointed out, they become a superpower. Yes, Anna. I find it interesting how it seems like, like, Everyone else around them, like, it seemed like the word got out, like, really well that everyone else came, that came to Egypt to get food. Oh, abs absolutely. Well, they were the only ones who had it. Yes, yes. Word gets around. The beggar knows. Uh, uh, beggar asks one beggar, you know, where the food is, and they point them in that direction. It doesn't take long when you're when you're hungry and your children are hungry and and you and you have no re other resources. Yes, James. I thought it was kind of cool and. I think a sign of God's hand on Pharaoh that even after the seven years, he still was like, go talk to Joseph, you know, oh, trust yeah. him still. Yeah, yeah, because it was, you know, you, you had 14 years of a leader that, 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 that saved your life, mm -hmm. that transformed your country, that, that, uh, that, you know, uh, uh, proved to be a, proved to be a, a, a just man. You know, uh, and I, I think his I think his dealings, even with the farmers and the dealers, even with those people around there, was of such a nature that people immediately trust him. I mean, Pharaoh trusted him after knowing him a couple of minutes. You know, after hearing the words of the prophecy, and then him turning around and giving him the answer on a platter. So here's what you need to do. You know that 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 uh, you know he 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 he. he it was something about Joseph. I believe it was the favor of God that that, that, that helped. Him. Yes. This is all different. Different area. <laughs> okay. But um, I, I just, uh, I thought it was interesting that um, Joseph obviously maintained his relationship with God. It said that he was given the daughter of the priest of On. Mm, yes. And yet down in verses, you know, 50 through 52, it said that when they bore sons, he named them after God. That's, that's Jehovah right. Jehovah God. Yeah, that, that's so, right. So he... Although he married the daughter of this priest, he mm -hmm. had apparently had much more of an influence over her than That's she right. had over him, which there are so many stories that are they going the opposite direction. That, that's right. This was not a Solomon experience where, 
but it, it was more because we know that you know those two that basically Joseph's uh, part was divided among two two sons that would be, become known as tribes of Israel, and so so we do know that they uh, that they uh, at least stayed within the family line and and, and served and, and and served God uh, uh, for for, gener for generations. Yeah. Any, any other observations? Anything else that you know? All great observations. I, I appreciate that. That's, I think, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of times you take me by surprise. I'm like, wow, wow, that, that's, a, that's something to cons that's something uh, for us to, to, really, to really dig into and, and, and to consider. Uh, but, but tonight we're going to be looking at what I call dream stewards. Dream stewards. Uh, somebody give me a definition of what a steward is biblically. Well, what it, especially in the New Testament context. Uh, uh, and we have a lot of material on, on what it means to be a good steward uh, in, in the teachings of Jesus and, and those around. What is what is a biblical definition of a good steward? Anybody? One who follows commands. Yeah, yeah. You can. Uh, they're obedient. That's right. Yes, Al. I would say basically the same thing. They're a, they're a servant who, uh, who who's always in the uh, uh, realm of, of, of doing the service that he's uh, su supposed to do. That, that, that's right. He's a, well, we'll call him a responsible servant. Call him, call him, call him people. Yeah, we'll call him a responsible servant. Yeah. Anything else that you can think of? Uh, that makes you a good servant. Yes, ma'am. Not only to care for what you've been given, but to make it even better. That, that, that's that, that's right. To 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 uh, improve. Anybody else? One who takes care of the owner's property. That's right. That's that. That's probably one of the greatest distinctions between what a steward is. A steward owns nothing, but a steward is responsible for everything. Yeah, he's, he's, yeah. he's an accountable servant. That's right. That's right. That is, it's not his property, but he's still accountable. Very accountable. A good, a good, uh, a, a, good a good steward. A good steward is, is uh, has a very different vantage point uh, to to the role that he plays. A good steward has been handed handed the signet ring and said, "Everything I have, you manage now." That's what stewardship uh, re really means. I was rather surprised to find out how seriously Jesus took stewardship. Do you know that in the that in, in the New Testament he spoke thirty eight parables, and out of thirty eight parables, sixteen of them dealt with being a good steward. Do you know that in the New Testament that he there was two hundred eighty eight verses on stewardship? That is ten percent of the New Testament that he talked about stewardship. Now we're not just talking about. And when I talk about stewardship, we're talking about uh, not, not, you know, a lot of times when you hear preachers talk about stewardship, it's all about money, you know, uh, money, money. But it, no, it's, it's, it's so much wider than that. It's about our talents, our gifts, our abilities, uh, 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 our time. It's, it's, it's about being the kind of good steward that, that, that Jesus wanted us to be. Yes. On our bodies, the, the, the temple of the Holy Ghost, so we're supposed to take care of it. That's right. That's right. We, our, 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 the physical, you know, uh, 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 it, 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 it reaches, it spans off so many things. But well, the thing that blows my mind is it's as if Jesus is saying, get this. I want to underline this. I want to hyphenate this. I want to do this. When you get to me, finally, at the end of things, I'm going to ask you, what did you do with what I gave you? That, that is, that, that's the, the message of stewardship there. And what we see here in the life of Joseph is the, is the blueprint for being a good steward. Joseph was a steward to, to, to Egypt. He was a steward to Pharaoh. But above all those things, he was a steward for God. 
He was a steward of the very dreams that God had given him. Yes, we saw the, the last time we were here, we saw how, how, jo how Joseph's dream had been expanded on. That, that basically uh, a Pharaoh had a dream and that was added on to the responsibilities. And along with that dream, Joseph got the answers. Why? Because God didn't give him a dream just to vindicate him. God didn't give him a dream just to promote him. God didn't give him just a dream to prove everybody else wrong. God gave him a dream to work it. He would spend the rest of his life working that dream. He would spend exactly the 14 years uh, uh, working the, uh, that, that dream. He would become that kind of steward that God would have for him to, to be. So when God put, put, places something in your heart to do and to, and, to, and to pursue and to move after, God has not just given us a, a, a vision. He's not just given us an anointing. He's given us something to steward. He's placing it in our hands and in our care so that we can know what to do. Two of the, two of the most known parables uh, in the New Testament are two parables that are distinctly, absolutely, the, the entire topic is on stewardship. And that's the parable of the talents and the parable of the unjust uh, 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 servant. Those are, are as clear cut as you can get that Jesus is saying when the, 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 the husbandman left everything to, to, the, to the people and he went off into a country and, and he came back and he judged them according to what they had done with, 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 with what they had. That is the definition of stewardship in, in our life. Uh, but don't, don't think that, that just because he was no longer in the pit and he was just no longer in Potiphar's house, and he was no longer in the prison, that his life was just laying around being fanned by big fans and eating grapes. No, his life was a challenge. It, it was, it was it, it, God had called him to do a work. He knew he had little time to do it. He acted and he moved forward in that. And now he had responsibilities that he never had before. Now he was, yeah, yeah, he had the responsibility in the prison. Now he, he had responsibility in Potiphar's house, but nothing like the ones that he had now. He had Pharaoh's signet ring. And what he said went. What he, how he moved went. His actions had repercussions. His actions had uh, affected people. His actions would affect an entire nation and ultimately entire uh, civilized world at, at the time. He had greater responsibilities. When we determine, Lord, I want to be a good servant. I want to be a good steward of what you've given to me. You know what happens? He gives you more responsibility. He places, how do you know that? Because I want you to notice the very first thing that this, this text points out to us is the, the first thing that happened is that after, uh, after he, uh, Joseph accepts the, uh, the, the invitation to take on this stewardship role, guess what he gets? He gets wife and kids. He becomes steward, so even a, in a, even a greater thing. His stewardship started in the household. His stewardship was as husband. His stewardship was as father. His stewardship had, had those special roles. So when we begin to when we begin to say yes to what God is saying in our life, we need to embrace Him and realize that what He desires from us is to be that kind of, of steward in our life. I believe that's what Pharaoh saw in this in, in Joseph. I believe that he looked down and he heard the plan. And he knew that this had been thoroughly thought through, even if it was just within, a, uh, just within moments of receiving this dream, that he understood that what he saw was somebody that could be trusted with everything he had. Somebody that was not out to toot his own horn. Somebody was not out proud and bragging and, and look at me, Pharaoh, but somebody was just simply saying, Pharaoh, here's the problem and here's the solution, period. You do with it what you want to do with it. And Pharaoh, so you're the man. You're the one that, 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 I, that, that, that will do this uh, in our life. So we need to, let's take that, let's take that, uh, take that, uh, uh, that, that vantage point. And let's realize that as stewards, first of all, we see things differently as stewards. Well, the first thing that we see is, is that we don't own anything. That we don't possess anything. What does, that, what does that mean? That means that, that these hands that I work with, God gave me those hands. The breath that I breathe, God gave me those breath. You know, uh, uh, the, 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 the talents and the skills I had, God gave me those talents. And it, all of those things is under the stewardship of, that God has given me and blessed in my life. So, so we have to realize that, 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 that they're not our own. Another one, and it is, it is, it is, it is shocking, 
uh, that, 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 that I don't think too many, uh, too many believers uh, cross their minds is one day I'm going to give an account for everything. Jesus even brought it this way. For every vain word you speak, you will give an account. I got a lot of accounting to do. I don't know about you. You know, it, it, but, it, but that's just showing the span of his account. He said, I'm going to bless you, but I'm going to bless you realizing that one day you're going to answer for what you did with that blessing in, in your life. Al? I was going to say, <clears throat> Joseph did, didn't come on, on the scene as a uh, reprieve prisoner out of, out of jail looking for a job. Yeah. He, before he even went, went to prison, he had an impeccable record of, of what you say, stewardship. Yes. You know, and all Pharaoh had to do was ask Potiphar what kind of a steward was Joseph when, you, when he worked for you. It's, 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 couldn't give him a bad that, report. That's right. It's amazing how, because, you know, as, as we kind of walk through this, we see, we see the keys of stewardship always at work in, 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 in Joseph's walk with God. He, he, he became, you know, uh, uh, Jesus put it this way, he who are faithful in a few things, I will make them ruler over many. We see that in Joseph's life just, just, so, just so perfectly clear uh, here in the Word of God. So let's, let's take a look at a few things that we need to learn about, about, uh, about these stewards. First of all, we need to look at what are dream stewards. What are dream stewards? What what did, what 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 are they what are they actually uh, made made of? You see, uh, he, here in the Word of God, we see uh, Joseph demonstrate to us what it means to steward the dream and even, even all, all the stuff that God had blessed him with and how God had, had, had touched him. But there are certain characteristics that you will notice <coughs> in a good steward. There are certain characteristics that we'll notice in Joseph's life as, as he walked through it. And there are certain characteristics that we need imperatively need to develop in our own lives, uh, in, in our own hearts. One of the first things that I see is they, re, they, they refuse comparison. A, set, a successful steward of what God has for them don't get caught in the comparison trap. They know how dangerous it can be. They know how, how terrible it, it can be. Uh, 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 Joseph could have compared his life every step of the way. Lord, how can you bless that man? Look what he's doing. How can you do, give to this person you haven't given to me? How can you make, let me stay in a pit? How could you make me? Pay? He would use the he could use the major word. Lord, all of this is just unfair, couldn't he? He could have compared it. My kids used to come to me and say, "That's unfair," and I have to sit them down and say, "Guess what? Life is unfair. You know, there's going to always be somebody have better than you. There's always going to be somebody stronger than you. There's all going to always be somebody smarter than you. There's a lot of times you're going to have people that's richer than you." I said, "Life is not designed to be fair. You can't compare it yourself." From everybody around you, or that is a that is a formula for for a disaster. And in in the spiritual realm, even in the church world, we need to realize we are not all equally gifted. We we don't we don't all have the same skills. We don't all have the same abilities. We don't all have the same uh, anointings. We don't all have the same uh, wisdom and understanding and, 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 and insight. But that does not mean that we are that we are we, that we are cast aside. What Joseph realized is, Lord God, I'm not going to compare myself with others, but I'm going to simply use what is in my hand. I like what he said to Moses. What's in your hand? You know, you know I'm not calling you to use anything but what you got. I'm not calling you to use anything. And, and be careful of comparison in your life. Comparison will divide a church. It will split a church. Compar uh, comparison will discourage people who are doing a good work. For the Lord, but because they see somebody else doing a better work, they become dis discouraged. It can defeat you. I've seen people throw up their hands and quit because they looked at somebody else that, were, that was that was that was getting getting blessed. Oh, you know. So we need to make sure in our lives that we say, Lord God, help me not to fall into the trap of comparison. Refuse comparison. 
Uh, you know, uh, uh, ask yourself, am I doing what I'm supposed to do with what God has given me? But, but don't look at what somebody else has done and what somebody else has been given and how somebody else has been, has been blessed. And, and Al pointed this out too. They are accountable. They are, in fact, uh, uh, accountable. Jesus here uh, le lets us know that although we are not all equally gifted and although we're not all equally blessed, we are all equally accountable. The parable of the, of the, of the talents teaches us that. Who did Jesus get angry with? Did he get angry with the person that had a lot? No. Did he get angry with the person that had a, a moderate amount? No. He got angry at the person that had nothing and lived in fear because of what, that he might lose that nothing instead of trusting God and, 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 and investing that that, that, that that he had. See, God wants us to see something, I believe, in that lesson. We are not all equally gifted, but we will all have to be accountable for what we have been given. I like what uh, uh, the, the Andrew Murray, anybody familiar with the writings of Andrew, Andrew Murray? Just a brilliant man. He said this, the world asks, what does a man own Christ asked, how does he use it? So that, that, that needs to be our, that needs to be our, Lord help me, Lord God, to be accountable for what you have given in my life. It's imperative uh, in my life. We got to see every moment, see every moment of this life as, a, as an opportunity to invest in the right things. And that may, that, that may not be, uh, uh, you know, it's not always in the offering plate. It's, it's investing in our time, investing in our efforts, investing in our health, uh, investing in things like that. We have to be good stewards of what God wants us to do. Now, I, lo I love, I love uh, verse number uh, 46, if you got your pages there, <coughs> because it, it suggests something that I think is powerful. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt after a short vacation to the Bahamas. <laughs> what? That, that, that's not, that, last, that last part must have come from the Derek's translation. What I see here is not somebody that took time to enjoy what he was being blessed with. He immediately went to work doing what he knew he was supposed to do. He left. I like the wording there. It said he, he stood before Pharaoh and Joseph went out from the very presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. I don't think he was just there to, on a parade. I believe Joseph was doing, making deals. I believe Joseph was doing business. I believe Joseph was, uh, was, was connecting with the largest fields uh, in, in Egypt. I believe Joseph had already said, why? Because he understood something. I'm going to be accountable for this. The clock is ticking. He understood, yeah, I got seven years, but the clock is ticking. In our lives, we need to realize that and, and embrace that uh, in our life. It's imperative uh, in our life. So we need, we need to, to realize that we, uh, that, that, that good stewards are accountable. They are also, I like this. They are important. No matter what their role, they are, in fact, Important. I, 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 love, I love that. We are, we are not all, all equally gifted. We're not all equally blessed. But we all are equally accountable. And we're all equally important. What is that? Why do you, why do you, say, why do you say that? Because we need to realize uh, uh, that, that when the owner of the property in the, palace of the, in the parable of the talents got angry with the, with the person that had little, it's not because that person wasn't important. It's because that person was vital to the success of everything he had. He was vital even with the very little that he had been given. Uh, to, to turn what he had given him into something wonderful and something great. And that he trusted that he could do that. God wants us to realize something. When he gives us anything, he's given to us that no matter how small the work, the role is always important in our areas to, to do to the very best that we need, need to do. I, lo I love that. He, uh, uh, Joseph proved that again and again. No matter what situation Joseph was in, he turned around and he said, this job is important. You're a slave. It's important. You're, you're, you're a prisoner. It's important. And then when he finally got to Pharaoh's house, lo and behold, it's important. He saw every position, every spot, every role that he did as something that was important. 
Remind me of a, of, a, of, of a man that walked up to this big building that was being built, and there was these stonemasons that were working uh, uh, around it, and they were laying these, these huge stones, and, and he walked up to one brick mason, he was, and he was stacking stone, putting mortar down, stacking stone, and he asked him, he said, sir, what are you doing? He said, I think it's obvious I'm building a wall. He said, okay. He walked around to the other side of the building. There was a guy over there. He was whistling and singing. And he was putting this, these same stones down, uh, making sure the mortar was just right and everything. He said, sir, what are you doing? He said, I'm building a cathedral. See, they were using the same resources, that had the same uh, supplies, had given all these things, but one man was just building a wall. Another man was building a cathedral. You see, the problem isn't what, what God has given us. The problem is how we see what God has given us. It's not, it's not, what, it's not what we think about the source and supply. It's not how, how blessed or less blessed we are. It's really how we embrace that in our life that makes us a good steward. God, you bless me. Now, Lord God, how, how, how will you be pleased with me using this? So these are what dream stewards are. They refuse to the comparison. They're accountable. They, and, and they are important. So, so that those are some those are some truths that we need to hang on to. If we stop right there, we can hang our hats on it and go, yeah, that's that that's that's good enough. But I think there's a, a, another truth that we need to realize. We need to realize what dream stewards are not. We we need to realize that that not only are they some things, but they're also not some things uh, uh, in our life. When we begin to be good stewards, we see things differently, and we respond differently than to other people around us. A good a steward doesn't act like the normal judge. A good steward doesn't act like the the rest of the crowd, the rest of the world. And we're gonna we're gonna see that we'll see that even in in Joseph's life when we compare him to the people in the times that he lived in and even in our times. You see, first of all, they are not consumers. They're stewards. What do you mean by that, Derek? A consumer, their question is what's in it for me? Their question is how does it benefit me? And a, a steward says, how can I improve on this? How can I make this better? How can I make that situation? You see, Joseph didn't find Egypt to be a, a great place to live. I don't believe he did. He had all the opposites of it, but he was still living among paganism. He was still living uh, it, uh, among people that didn't believe in his God or trust his God. It wasn't a nice assignment uh, for Joseph. But Joseph didn't come in there saying, why, why, this doesn't please me, Lord. He come in and said, Lord, I'm here because I'm part of the solution. I'm here because you sent me here to solve some things. You sent me here to, to bring glory uh, to, to your name. That is, that is, that's important in our life. Joseph wasn't shopping for the perfect situation. He saw this as an opportunity to be faithful. Now, one of the things I find most disturbing about our current generation and the body of Christ is our churches are producing consumers at a much, much, much higher rate and stewards. What's in it for me, Pastor? You know how you know what what you know, we'll we'll go we'll shop for a church like we shop for a pair of shoes. You know, instead of saying uh, this is where God has brought me and God has led me, I'm gonna be part of the solution. I'm gonna be part of what God is doing. Too often we begin to look down that right way. Yes. I saw that in the dental office when children would come in, but they didn't want to lay in the chair. They don't want to open their mouth. Well, if you do that, we're gonna go to Toys R Us and we're gonna get a little oh, yeah. extra. Absolutely. They drive them all the time. And the, you know, what happened to a kid doing something because you told them to do it? That, that's right. That's right. Because you're supposed uh, to do that. It, and it's that, it's that, it's that steward-consumer mindset that's so different. So we need to realize that Joseph said, I'm not, I'm not, that's not me. That's not who I, I, I am. You see, stewards are uh, uh, accountable. Uh, are, 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 are accountable stewards know notice what it said in verse number 48 I like, I like this so he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities he laid it up in every city the food of the fields which surrounded them Bruce was fine enough to, to catch those same words that I caught and that was he gathered 
and he laid it up. You know what that means? It didn't say he went out there and he, and he, and he, and he had a crew. It sounds like he rolled his sleeves up, didn't it? It sounds like that he got involved in what was going on. It sounds like that he was a part of the solution. I believe some people didn't even know it uh, years later, years later, when they got a scoop of the, of the grain that, that Joseph's hands was, in that, was, was in, in that grain because he was a part of the solution. He, was not, he didn't have this consumer mindset, but Lord, how can, can you bless me? He's like, Lord, how can you use me? To use what you've given me and bless me. So we need to uh, em embrace that. Also, they're not just not consum consumers. They're not spectators. They don't just sit on the sidelines. You see, Pharaoh. Uh, uh, once Pharaoh mentioned to Joseph this, he didn't decline what he what 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 he was offered. He didn't say, "Well, I'll just do it under a." you know, uh, uh, under consignment or didn't say, I'll just be a critic on the sideline. No, Joseph said, I'll do it. I'll get involved. Uh, why? Because he was a steward. He was used to taking care of everybody else's stuff. He was used to managing well, even above and beyond what he did uh, with his stuff. I remember when we rented a, a house in a, and it had been years since I rented because we had this little place in, in Edgefield that was our own. But I remember talking to the gentleman there that was, that was uh, showing me his house around. And he said, he said, well, he said, we've done a lot of work on this house. And I said, well, sir, I can assure you one thing. I said, I'm going to treat this house better than my own. And he stopped and he looked at me and he said, well, that's really good to hear. Because you see, sometimes people was like, well, I'm just going to make do. But because it wasn't mine, I felt a greater responsibility to take care of what I was, what he was being gracious enough uh, to, to, to rent for us. Years later, he was like, I hope y'all would just stick around here and, and, and continue to rent. Why? Because once you find somebody who's not just a spectator, but somebody who's, whose lives is, 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 is engaged. Spectators are engaged when it's exciting. Spectators are engaged when they feel like they're benefiting. Spectators are engaged when there's a special event going on. But you want those, those stewards are people that are faithful in and out. Those stewards are fa who are faithful when things are going good and when things are not so good. Those, those, those stewards are, are not spectators. They are, in fact, stewards. Now, one more, one more, one more area that I think that we need to... We need to take a look at here is not only what they are, not only what they are not, but let's look at what dream stewards do. What does dream? I'm, I'm hoping my notes are lining up with your notes uh, out there. Become kind of reliant on this on the screen. That, that's for sure. Uh, uh, as stewards, God provides resources, uh, uh, but we must use them. God's not going to give us something and then say, okay, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, and, and, and just do all the work for us. God calls us to, to put our hands to, to work. God calls us to do something, to make that dream what God has for that dream to be. Notice a few things that, that, that he did. First of all, he maximized The resources. I think it was Rhonda that pointed out that he improved upon things. He, may, he took what he had and he maximized it. They, we see that throughout the parables of, 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 of stewardship where Jesus talks about those that sold or those that planted or those that, the, those that, that hired more laborers, those that did all these things to maximize what God had given them. I mean, the, what the landowner had given them so that they could return back to the landowner of uh, what, what, uh, what, what was done, done before. I love this. Notice what he said in verse 49. He says, Joseph gathered very, good, very much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped coming for it until he stopped counting for it was immeasurable the first thing that he the resource that he maximized is time he maximized time verse 57 and the seven years of famine began to come as joseph had said the famine was in all lands but in all the land of egypt there was bread maybe you don't suffer from what i suffer from and then as I watch the clock, 
in my life. I know, I, 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 I think of what David said, learn to number your days. And see, and I, I look at, I mean, my brother-in-law that I was at his funeral last week was nine years older than I am today. Uh, the, my, my, my dad, my dad passed away about 20 years from where I am right now. And, and, and one of my prayers became before I came here is, Lord, help me to maximize my years. Help me to use the years that I have left. So when I stand before you, Lord, I, I'll, I'll be able to say, thank you, Lord, for, for everything. And then that I can hear those powerful words, well done, thou good and faithful service. Enter into it, we, we, our time is a resource that we, that we need to learn uh, uh, to, to maximize uh, in our life. As parents, we learn one thing, too. We learn something that, that, that I believe applies to our spiritual life. We, we understand that time is oftentimes equal to love. Especially when our children. How many of you would like to go back to when your kids were little and do it all over again? Spend more time with them than you allotted. Because you look back and you're like, you know, how much time did I waste on that issue and that, the other issue? But can I tell you, in, in the spiritual world, it's the same way. Time is allotted to, to how we love God. And how we trust God. And if we use our time as a resource to God, we are in fact saying, I love you, Lord. I love you more than anything else. I love you more than, 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 life, than life itself. Also, he, uh, 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 his commodities. What he had, what he possessed. Uh, verse, number, verse number 56. The famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph uh, opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, and the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. As we, had, as we had discussed, what was the commodities that was hidden in his hand? There was, the, there, was the, there was the grain and there was the money. He had to manage both of those. Yes? One more thing you've got to think about here. Uh, the text says that the, the produce, what was produced in the land was unmeasurable. He mm -hmm. didn't stop counting. He had to have a building program for additional storage places. Oh, absolutely. So, so yeah. he, he had to have some type of a uh, ratio of, as the grain was produced, he had to have some place to put it. Otherwise that's it that's right. Wild. That's right. So he, he was, he was, he was, he was, man, he was, he was, man, he was, he was managing a workforce more likely. Yeah, you know, uh, the, the, the field workers, he was managing the, the, the silo builders, I guess if they call them silos in, in those times. He was, man, he was managing all these things. And then he turned around and, and he managed and he managed his money. Now, although, the, although money is not, not a subject that we loved <coughs> to talk about, <coughs> almost in every parable that Jesus taught on it included money. Because he, because he, he, he showed, he showed it. Uh, well, one writer, and, and, and I hadn't run this number down, but, but, but I believe it. He said that this one subject that Jesus talked about more than any other subject was money. I'm like, I'm like, wow, wow. But you see, we, we, uh, what this, what it is telling us is that, is that, what, is that our, our, our money oftentimes reflects uh, our, our stewardship, where our heart is located, what, what, we're, what we're doing there. Reminds me of an old mountain guy that was not really a, a nice guy. And he got, he got got sick and he was laying in his bed and he called his wife to his bed. He said, sweetie, he said, I think I'm going to die soon. He said, he said, but I don't want you to do this until I die. And she said, what's that? He said, I want you to go in the fireplace and count three bricks down, take out that big brick, brick, brick uh, out of there and reach your hand back there and pull out what you find back there. He said, take what you find back there and take it up to the attic, put it in the windowsill. And when I die, I'm going to get it on the way up. And so, so sure enough, he dies. She goes down there and his obedient wife, she pulls it out, takes out a big old jar full of cash, takes it upstairs, puts it in the windowsill, uh, uh, goes, gets him buried, goes to the funeral and stuff. And a few days later, she's sitting there and said, I wonder if he grabbed his money. So she went up into the attic and there it sat right there on the windowsill. She said, I knew I should have put it in the basement. <laughs> because sometimes in our lives, you know, there's this old saying, you can't take it with you. But there's one way you can. Jesus showed us how. He said, for where your treasures are, there your heart is also. To invest in the kingdom. To invest what God wants in your life. That investment takes all kinds of shapes and forms. But, it, but if, we, if we learn, Lord God, help me to manage what you've given me. 
Lord God, with my strength, my ability, my time, my finances, my commodities, the things that I possess. So it, it, it is, it's, it's, a very, it's very important for us uh, to, to, to in, embrace that in our life. But not only did he maximize resources, Joseph maximized relationships. Joseph saw it as important the relationships that they built. We see it from the time that he was that he was in Potiphar's house. He, you know, that he had a great reputation with those that he worked with. We see it in in the prison where he actually approaches these two gentlemen that was in distress, and he invests in them, and, and, and God would use that. We we we, we would see it uh, in his dealings with Pharaoh. But for him to accomplish what he accomplished, he had to be filled with relationships. He had to be filled with people that were willing to work alongside of him, filled with people that would share his dreams. We need to understand the very value of relationships. In my past, I've, 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 I've made the mistake too often of letting go of relationships in pursuit of something that was not worth that relationship. A business a venture, a, a, you know, a, a, you know, a, e e even even walking away from you know from from a, from a lifelong relationships because I moved and never stayed in touch, and and, and I look back and I'm saying, Lord God, I should have been better use of the relationships that you gave me. And what a blessing they have been in my life. We need that relationships in our life. Joseph proved when he took his two sons to to to, to Jacob to be blessed. He proved. These are my priorities. These are, are, are what I see as, as vital and important. Bless them like you blessed, like you would bless me, uh, uh, Father. He, he, was, he was showing them that we need to make sure that that friendship, that we realize that our friendships are God's gifts, and there's something that God gives to us. And can I tell you that one of the biggest uh, uh, accommodations, I mean, one of the biggest fodder of a good friendship is time and difficulty. So you can make it through those two. You can have friendships that last forever. I can tell you friends that I had that, 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 that they, just, they just weren't good friends when I first met them. We went through a lot, and, they, and, and over time, it, it, it shaped. And then finally, not only did he maximize his resources and his, and his relationships, but he maximized his faith. As Michelle pointed out, his relationship with God stayed strong. It stayed strong enough for him to, that when he had his two boys that were born, uh, he named them as reminders to what God had done for him and what God was doing for him now. I like that. It was a past tense view and it was a present tense. Notice what in verse 51 and 52 said. Joseph called the name of his firstborn Manasseh. And here's the name, meaning of that name. For God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. What is he saying? All the junk that was in my past, God has made me forget it. Did that mean he, was, he actually forgot it? No. It just meant that the, it was healed. It was no longer an issue in his life. And what had happened with his brothers was no longer an issue in his life. What, would, what had happened in the prison was no longer an issue. I, I thought of, about this uh, the other week. I said, he was now at the uh, at a position where he could have executed Potiphar's wife. He was now in a position that he could have had the, the cupbearer killed for forgetting him. He was now in a position that he could have been he could have, he could have done all kinds of matter of revenge. But no, that was not in his heart. Why? Because above all of it else, he had a faith in God. He had a relationship with God, and he knew that God had it in control. All. Oh. All the while. Didn't notice what he said in this verse 52. I love this. And the name of the second he called Ephraim. For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. So every time he called their names, he was reminding them of the goodness of God. Every time he called their names, he was saying, God brought me here and God's kept me here. I, I like, I, 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 I love that. When I was calling my children uh, their names, I, uh, uh, Michelle said, you, you pick out the names, I get, I get to deny or approve any of them that, that, that we, that we get. And, and, and I really look for meanings of, the, of, of those names. Hannah, Hannah's name is Hannah Marie. That's actually two, two words that mean the same thing. Grace. Means grace on grace. Because she was God's grace upon God's grace. 
Uh, Joe's name was Joe Benjamin. But Joe was, Joe was, uh, Joe was uh, meaning Jehovah is my God. And Benjamin means son of my right hand. And in a few weeks, we're gonna, I'm going to bring you a Christmas message to tell you, that tells you exactly why I call him, his middle name, Benjamin. Uh, because of, because of, uh, of, 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 of a picture, a shadow that God cast uh, for, for us. You see, we need to hold to that faith. Success without faith in God is not success at all. Achievement without, uh, without achieving with God is not achievement at all. We can be rich and dead and leave our money on the windowsill all day long. It's not going to do us any good. But when we truly embrace God as good stewards and stand before him that day and say, son, you know that little thing that you did for so-and-so? This is what it turned out to be. Son, you know, when you heard my voice and you responded this way, you know, when you, when, you, when, you, when you pulled up your family from Colorado and you, you took off across the country not knowing what waited for you because we didn't, he's like, those, that, those are acts of stewardship where we say, Lord God, what you give me, I will, I will, I will, uh, I will be responsible for. I want to be that kind of good steward. Next week, uh, next week, uh, if, if you're reading along, we've got a, we got a, a, a kind of healthy passage. We're going to be looking at verses 40, I mean chapters 42 through 45. Because, and, and we're going to, although we're going to focus on one part of that passage, um, I believe that entire passage kind of brings the same thing. And so we're going to kind of touch, touch on those. So if you're following this, Genesis 42 and 45. And Sarah says, Amen. God bless you. Appreciate you. Bring it to a close, Pastor. That's right. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Usually I put her to sleep, so it's true.